out of a busy schedule to join us today. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. Professor Arkin, as you know, I'm Richard O'Meara. I'm one of the fellows here at the uh, Stockdale Center. And uh, you've been kind enough to come down here and be interviewed with regard to uh, some of the information that you gave us at the, the conference upstairs today regarding robotics, the ethics of robotics, and your work. I understand you've worked in the field for over 25 years, is that correct? That's approximately correct, yes. And it's been a pleasure to share this information uh, at the uh, conference today uh, as well. I've worked in a variety of different uh, areas, mostly Department of Defense related research, from DARPA to the Army to the Navy, uh, and currently uh, still doing it. So would you refer to yourself, is there a term roboticist? That's Robotist? No roboticist, you, you've got the phrase. What is a roboticist? Uh, a roboticist, at least to me, uh, and it's, that's a good question actually because it's uh, a relatively new term and I suppose you could thank Isaac Asimov uh, for that uh, as he invented the science of robotics, although not the word robot. Uh, it's a person who tries to uh, create and endow uh, machines with intelligence. And can you give us a, a, a definition of what a robot is? Uh, that's another moving target as well too, and it depends perhaps on the day that you ask me. I have a working definition in my first book which probably escapes me uh, at the moment, uh, but I'll try. It's, it's an agent that uh, senses and acts in its environment in a purposeful and meaningful way. And there can be, there can be robots as I understand it that, that humans operate and robots or there may be robots down the road uh, that will be able to operate independently of humans. Is that correct? That's correct. There's an entire spectrum. It ranges from uh, almost radio control to remote control where the agent is in full view of the operator to teleoperation where the agent is operating outside to structured or semi-autonomous uh, operations where there's a combination of human mixed initiative and the robot itself eventually moving towards full autonomy where the agent is capable of maintaining and executing its actions pretty much by itself. Now we're all pretty familiar with the fact that at least in some form or another robots seem to be in on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. You're familiar with that obviously. Uh, yes, I have. Could you give us just a general spectrum of what kinds of things robots do for the military presently? Uh, a whole bunch of different things as well too. Most everyone understands the Predator and Reaper operations that are going on run out of Creech Air Force Base uh, in Nevada and being missions being conducted in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, initially for uh, surveillance uh, information, uh, now for engagement, uh, the deployment of Hellfire missiles and uh, other armaments in the case of the Reaper. But they also, a great introduction uh, is The Hurt Locker, the Oscar award winning uh, movie uh, that just uh, uh, won uh, for last year, uh, and the use of explosive ordnance disposal where uh, human soldiers uh, command these vehicles usually through a, a joystick type of interface to uh, investigate uh, potentially dangerous objects by the side of the road and uh, if possible uh, plan a charge and uh, disarm them. Now during the course of the conference We've talked about a lot of benefits of these kinds of robots. Could you tell us just generally what some of those benefits are? Sure. Uh, the notion of what's called force multiplication, the ability of a single warfighter to do the job of many, uh, which uh, results in a potential force reduction uh, and no draft, uh, things that many people seem to be uh, in favor of, and all maintenance of an all-volunteer army is probably a better way uh, to phrase that. Um, the ability to expand uh, into the battle space and conduct operations over larger battle spaces for some of the work for the Navy, for example. We were concerned with teams of surface vehicles, air vehicles, uh, and undersea vehicles operating in regions uh, over uh, hundreds of miles off of a coast of interest uh, called broad area maritime surveillance. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and I guess that's uh, the, the main uh, thrust of that. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned today during the conference was the ability of, uh, of predators, etc., uh, to linger over targets for long periods of time yes. and gather more information than the normal human shooter would, able to, would be able to get. Right. And I should have added to the last one, of course, the reduction of friendly casualties is a very important uh, aspect of uh, this as well, too. But you're correct. Um, one of the things is robots don't have to go to the bathroom. Robots don't have to eat. Robots don't need oxygen. Robots don't need life support of any way, shape, uh, or form. 
uh, they don't need, as we were talking just earlier in the conference, uh, dexamphetamine uh, to stay uh, awake. And uh, indeed, DARPA, I believe, has a program, uh, uh, I don't know if it's under bid right now or under development called Vulture, which is uh, designed to have a vehicle aloft for up to five years. Uh, no human pilot obviously had that capability, except unless you include the space station or something like that. Interesting that a lot of the concepts for robots come out of science fiction, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, historically, it's been uh, quite interesting that they have served as inspiration uh, for uh, many uh, of my colleagues and perhaps for myself uh, as well. But there's dangers associated with that. One of the big dangers is everyone sees these Hollywood movies and they assume that the technology exists because uh, they see robots like the Terminator or uh, the Wingman and uh, the movie Stealth and a variety of other applications, Short Circuit or what have you. And the reality is we're nowhere near uh, those particular points at this point in time in terms of machine intelligence. I recall a, statistics in my, a statistic in my reading that had to do with a congressional law, I think it was passed in the early, maybe 2000, 2001, that dealt with a requirement by Congress that some large percentage of vehicles, mm -hmm. meaning vehicles to do logistics, et right. cetera, have to be uh, uh, robotic by a certain time frame. Well, it wasn't even just logistics. It's the Warner mandate is what it was referred to. I believe it was passed in 2001, if I remember correctly. And although I'm not 100% certain of the language as I recollect it, I believe it said that in 10 years, uh, one third of all deep strike aircraft should be unmanned. Uh, and in 15 years, uh, which would be, I guess, 2016 as opposed to 2011, one-third of all uh, ground vehicles uh, for the military should be unmanned. That, that uh, statistic struck me specifically. That kind of brought it home to me, the idea that if you go to any military post, uh, Army uses a lot of vehicles, for example, uh, one-third of all the vehicles military vehicles are going to be ro robots. Right. Well, this was a, a mandate, an unfunded ma Well, I guess the Congress does provide funding for it uh, at some level as well, too. And the Pentagon took their uh, marching orders very seriously, as well they should. Uh, and if you look now at the roadmaps that have been created by uh, the Department of Defense, uh, by the Air Force, by the Navy, uh, even though we might not have achieved that particular time frame, uh, significant progress, significant investment, and significant hopes for success of moving more and more people out of harm's way through the use of unmanned systems is entirely possible. Great. Now, I, I, I believe we're, we're doing this interview for the benefit of young uh, sailors, soldiers, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, etc., who will be living in this in the next 10, 20, 30 year period. And it occurs to me that these new mandates are going to change the culture of those services. Mm -hmm. You've done much thinking about that? Uh, some, perhaps not enough. Uh, one of the things I'm most concerned with in the deployment of these systems, particularly the weaponized versions uh, of these, is to make sure that they are deployed in a manner that is consistent with our nation's ideals and adhere to the laws of war and the rules of engagement as much as possible. Uh, our young men and women who are thrown uh, into harm's way are now fighting different wars uh, than their fathers and grandfathers uh, and beyond uh, have fought with the tempo of the battlefield being much, much faster uh, than it was in times past. This creates new opportunities for error uh, to occur uh, from an ethical perspective. It was interesting also, Peter Asaro, who I spoke to this morning, we had the opportunity to talk to the midshipmen over lunch uh, as well. Uh, uh, noted that uh, their, uh, they were raised, the first generation of digital warriors is the best way to describe it. Uh, they were born in a time uh, when all the technology, which is new to old folks such as, as, as myself, I won't mention you, but <laughs> you're not in camera so they don't have to know. Uh, uh, it just changes, uh, changes our culture, certainly, but they were born into this. Now there are concerns with that though as well too, because you're raised on a video game in a gaming type of environment, you have interfaces and things might seem unreal at some uh, aspect. If we do not do uh, proper care and due diligence to ensure that people fully understand what's going on with these systems and the design of appropriate ethical interfaces to make sure that they function uh, in ways that are appropriate and consistent with our ideals. So I think it's fair to say, see if you agree with me, that the future leaders uh, as early as next year 
are going to have to deal with this transformation that's occurring fairly rapidly. Absolutely. I heard the first time uh, that the Air Force this year has graduated more uh, UAV uh, pilots than they have conventional uh, pilots as well. They've also changed their policy though to some extent recognizing that being in the aircraft is important because it used to be the sensor uh, uh, operator didn't have to be a certified pilot, but as I understand things now, they are uh, being flight qualified as well too, so they can understand what it means to be in the air and provide a greater realism and understanding of the information that's coming back to them. Uh, do you have any closing comments with regard to this obviously uh, challenging field that's occurring? It is an obviously challenging field. It's moving at a breathtaking pace. You can see advances. Just follow the AUVSI newsletter or whatever it is to see all the new things that are happening, not only in this nation, but around the world in terms of the use uh, of unmanned technology. It's crucially important that we continue this discussion of the proper and appropriate use of unmanned systems uh, into the future and at an international level. Uh, this is not a U.S. issue.